whenever you do what I do up here each week, you try to put some thoughts down on a piece of paper. Some, uh, some of the subjects are not the easiest to come up with illustrations, for instance, since a lot of times I'll tell you I, I end up uh, using the computer a lot for my research. I do have a big paper library as well, book library, but I find myself looking for terms on the computer that I otherwise would have no interest in whatsoever, and this is one of them that I'll begin with this morning. I uh, came across an article online after I put into a search engine how to become wise. And I was just wondering, there had to be somebody out there who was uh, curious about this and for whatever reason thought that Google might have the answer to that uh, age old question. And I was somewhat surprised and interested that a psychological journal uh, had a, uh, had a uh, response here. And I clicked on it and this author, I don't remember who it was honestly, uh, they came up with some practical suggestions to be wise. And this uh, piqued my interest, first of all, but I'll take things in order here. Things like, well, the first thing you do, I guess, in the comfort of your home, uh, sit comfortably. Okay, done. <laughs> and uh, close your eyes. Okay, can do that. Take deep breaths to settle you. At that point, I was struggling not to fall asleep, but I was trying to be obedient to what they said. And then they get into the meat of it now. They said, okay, see if you can imagine a future where people see you as wise and are asking you what you've learned in life. Okay, this was a little too out there for my liking, but it did get me to think, how, how would I answer that and how would any of us answer that question? And first of all, I thought, well, what I wouldn't do is give them a step-by-step -step program like this author's trying to do because I know it just doesn't work that way. I mean, I don't know how wise I would rank on the wisdom scale, but at least wise enough to know that this isn't the way that you go about doing it. So the point is wisdom is not a formula and uh, you gain it generally by experience. And uh, I got to thinking, where in the Bible do we find a lot of wisdom and the word wise? And first of all, I thought Proverbs. That's where you got to go. And I looked at, I, I started looking from the beginning of Proverbs every time I spotted the word wise. And I looked, what was the context behind that? Well, there were a lot, and Proverbs isn't a real big book. There's 30-some Proverbs in there. Um, first, they talk about wise in terms of listening, and wise in terms of learning, wise in terms of fearing God, and then shunning evil, honoring God, taking instruction, and that was only through the first several Proverbs. And I thought, okay, this is going to go on for a while. So I cut my uh, you know, search there. But there's a difference between Christian wisdom and secular wisdom as we see. The secular wisdom is similar to what I shared with you from the psychological journal. First step is clear your head. That's what they tell you to do. But that's the exact opposite of what God tells us to do. God says we should fill our head specifically with the things of God and things that we learn from God's word. So there's, a, there's really not much intersection at all between uh, Christian wisdom and secular wisdom. Now last week we talked a bit about some of the darker times in our lives and I just want to add to that that uh, during the difficult times in life we don't need, uh, one of the last things we need is blame for the things that go wrong and I would also say we probably don't need a lot of the pipes, pop psychology kind of stuff to either uh, people trying to swoop in and they're the smartest person in the room and I can fix your problem for you kind of a thing. Uh, you can be a person that others in the church uh, go to for help. They say that, I don't know if they maybe use the word wise, maybe they would, but they say, hey, that person has it all together. And when I need help, 
well, they might be able to help me. Maybe they are a rather wise person. Maybe you're a person that people want to listen to. It reminds me of uh, Ecclesiastes. Uh, Solomon wrote a lot of the Proverbs. He also wrote Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 5.2 says, Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Pretty good verse, I thought there. I might try to uh, commit that one to memory. People who are use fewer words, probably have a, people have, might have a higher uh, view of them as far as wisdom goes, because the Bible says, this is how you want to live. Um, John, uh, getting to his letter, he ends his letter, we're going to look at the first half of his last chapter, uh, he ends it with a bang here, I think. There's some really good foundational Christian Doctrine, some Christian stuff in here. And honestly, when I went, I started looking through it, I thought, well, verse one could be a message, and verse two could be a message, and verse three, and I, of course, didn't want to spend that much time on these verses, so I'm just hitting the big points here. But if you grasp what John is saying, you can be that person who at least other people think you have it under control. You know inside that's probably not true all the time, but maybe more so than the other times. Then the church, first of all, should be full of like-minded people. In a sense, doesn't mean that we all like to eat the same thing for dinner. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the big picture here. And the thing is, how did the church get to that point where it is compar comprised of like-minded people? Nobody's born a Christian. We then get converted. We get saved. We come into the fellowship. Something in us changes from when we were pre-Christian to a uh, full member of the church. When you're converted, you typically find that maybe some more than others, you have to set aside certain beliefs that you had. Uh, like I said, maybe some more than others. You find out some things I believed or some things I did were not compatible with the Christian faith. So you find out and you realize something must change. Now, I came across a story given by John MacArthur. This was over a year ago. I can't remember when. I just, the story always stuck with me. And uh, I just looked up some details to refresh my memory. And uh, he tells the story where he was uh, preaching in his church like he, uh, you, you know, we know he does. And one Sunday he saw a new face in the congregation. And he had a much larger church than us, so to notice a new person uh, is uh, interesting. And uh, he didn't think much of it until after the service, this new uh, man came up to him. And he says, uh, Pastor MacArthur... I need to talk to somebody. He says, I feel like I was led here this morning and my life is in a shambles right now. So what John did, he said, let's set up a time, come to my office this coming week and we'll talk about whatever it is. So they do that. And in a few days he shows up in the office and uh, the gist of the discussion is like this. The guy, he sits down, he says, first of all, this is who I am. He says, I have a successful business, I am divorced, I am Jewish, and he says, my job is I am a doctor who performs abortions. If a young girl comes into my clinic, and if she doesn't have a reason to abort, I give her a reason, and then I charge her a fee for it. So you can imagine what John MacArthur's thinking at this point. He's like, yeah. and uh, the man then says, can you help me? And the way that John MacArthur tells the story, he says, he's thinking in my, in my mind, no, I can't help you. This is more than I can do for sure. But he did tell him, he says, I can't help you, but I know someone who can. And he pulls out a Bible and he starts telling him about Jesus. 
and uh, making it the story shorter. Uh, he says, I want you, here's, here's your homework. He says, I want you to turn to the Gospel of John. It's 21 chapters long. I want you to start reading it from chapter 1. Read it through and read it. Keep rereading it until you know who Jesus is because that Gospel will tell you who Jesus is. So the man takes up the challenge, and he did, and sometime later, he comes back to John MacArthur. He says, hey, I did what you told me to. I want to let you know that I just wrote a resignation letter to the clinic. I'm leaving there because I know that I can't continue in that work while I'm following God. I'm no longer following the Jewish religion. I am now a Christian. And uh, he said... Um, you know, uh, he, he uh, was resigning without even having a job lined up. He says, I know that God's going to take care of me because I'm following him. So it was quite a story. And to hear, I'm not giving it the justice that Pastor MacArthur gives, of course, when he tells it. But when some people come to Christ, it is dramatic. It's like a person completely convicted to leave their job and their whole livelihood to do something else. Uh, sort of like the Apostle Paul being struck down on that road to Damascus. But regardless, again, some people, it takes that to become like-minded with the congregation of believers. Other people, not so dramatic, but still should be some changes. But in the end, we're all experiencing the same God, and we decide we are not going to follow the world anymore. And we can help people now by reminding them when they are in the same situation we were in, that you're a new creation in Christ now, and none of that other stuff matters anymore. And uh, you're just uh, you know, living a new life. And uh, in the world, there's fear everywhere. Uh, we need to remind our fellow believers, and especially new believers, that we need not fear the enemy anymore because God overcame the enemy for us. And we need to focus now on following Jesus. I've heard it put like this. Imagine uh, you're walking down the road and in one hand you're holding the hand of God and the other hand you're holding the hand of the devil. It doesn't work like that. It's not going to continue because they're going to keep pulling you uh, different sides and it's just not going to work. So you need to pick one or the other. And also something else that may be an uh, idea that we need to correct in our thinking when we come to the faith is that uh, the Bible is not just a, a book of rules to follow. Some people say that, you know, so many rules and I get bogged down with all that. There are rules, of course. There's commandments and things like that. But more so, the Bible's the story of God. And it's the story of his love for us as well. And uh, John says in, uh, the, um, in his uh, letter here that God's commands are not burdensome. And now that's uh, the intro for uh, the scriptures this morning, a uh, bit of a longer intro than I normally give. But if you're following in your pew Bible, you'll find it on page 864. We'll be reading in uh, 1 John 5 from uh, verse 1 through 12. And the word of the Lord says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. And this is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his son. Anyone who believes in the son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out 
do not, do not believe God, has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. May the Lord's blessing be added to the reading and hearing of his holy word. So going back to that verse that John said, uh, God's commands are not burdensome. There's su such great truth in that. Because think of it, like at least I can say uh, from my perspective, God, when you th just take the Ten Commandments, for instance, it's not a loss for me that now that I'm a Christian, I can't murder somebody or I can't steal, or I can't commit adultery. Again, it's, that's not a burden for me to have to follow those commands of God. Remember a year or so ago, and I was looking back, I couldn't believe it seemed like so long ago because so many things in the news happened since then. I don't know if you remember the, um, the uh, story, a controversy maybe about Mr. Potato Head and how the uh, toy company wasn't going to use Mr. anymore because you're getting rid of the gender and all that kind of stuff. And then around that time, you know, Dr. Seuss, uh, his books were out of print because the one was considered racist because of a drawing in there and that kind of stuff. And what all has happened since then? I mean, recently you had this situation where uh, this uh, young man wins a women's swim meet and people are okay with this now. The thing is, um, just a word about that, the, the culture changes so drastically at times, sometimes it's hard to keep up with it. I mean, as far as like, men competing in the women's sports and vice versa. I mean, for some reason, I they would arrest me if I walked into a girl's locker room, but if I say that I am a female, apparently that's okay. But how many things are being normalized now that even 10 or 20 years ago, or 30 or not even 30 or 40 years ago, would have been unthinkable then. And it, culture's trying to change things and shake up things in a big way. I don't want to talk a lot about these things because they make me upset. They make me angry. I guess I'm an old fuddy-dud. I like, you know, the good old days kind of a thing. But there's times I need to remind myself when I see these things on the news and I hear people talking about them, none, none of it really matters in the big scheme if I'm grounded in Christ. I mean, yes, it matters for it's the world that our kids have to grow up in and those kind of things. But in the big scheme, whenever we're surrounded, uh, when we surround the throne of God in the end and we're singing praises to him, is anyone going to remember any of that stuff? I, I don't think we are. There's some pushback against those drastic changes, but uh, secular culture, as I said, just changes so easily. For example, there was a time in this country when uh, there was a large portion of the population approved of slavery. Okay, uh, We went to war to end that. So if you were following the masses and if everybody else thought slavery was okay, I think slavery is okay. At what point then do I say, okay, now slavery is not okay with me because most people think that's a bad idea anymore. And uh, the same with, you know, men in the girls' locker rooms and that kind of stuff. And um, it's just difficult to see these values that we hold dear to us disappear. And I think it's helpful to have someone come alongside you, someone reared in the faith and mature in the faith, and someone who's willing to speak Christ's name among the chaos and to say, the Bi this is what the Bible says about these issues. These aren't, people try to say they're political issues, that they're biblical issues because the Bible talks about them. Now, we recently on Wednesday night just finished up a Bible study on encouragement. And I mentioned during the announcements, I think everyone in that study really enjoyed this book. And I, I uh, wasn't sure what to expect when I first came across it and was pleasantly surprised. But for several weeks, we talked about Barnabas. And he is mentioned uh, several times in the book of Acts. Uh, his name means son of encouragement. 
and uh, it made sense with a study on encouragement, of course. Now, I'd say he's not really among the well-known Bible characters, you know, not like Jonah, Moses, David, uh, Peter, Paul, those kind of guys, but he's very important, and he's in the Bible for a reason, for us to learn from him. And uh, some of the things we learn from him is uh, about ways to encourage other people. And sometimes we need to encourage others because uh, it helps to validate uh, their opinions of themselves. Sometimes people just feel really down in the dumps and they're like, they need someone to come alongside them and encourage them and say, you are a child of God. You're created in his image. And even if you sinned and did something that you shouldn't have, that's not the end of the story. One of my pet peeves of, in general about um, some people who I would say are a little more immature in the faith is when people downplay their own abilities and talents. Uh, sometimes I hate it when I hear people say, well, I could never do that. Or, you know, I'm just not that good in that area. And I think, why not? You know, what can't God accomplish through you if you allow him? And again, we're not all gifted in the same area, but uh, we just, we all have access to the power of Jesus. And uh, believe me, God has used me well beyond what I thought my abilities were. And I just, I guess, out of a humble spirit, don't think I've been used. I mean, I'm not, you know, Billy Graham or anything like that. We have different giftings and we all have access to the power of Jesus. And it's similar to what John writes in verse 12. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So no matter what you're dealing with, you have life there. And this is life granted to you by God. And uh, again, what can't he do with a willing person? Now, history tells us John wrote this letter after he wrote the gospel that bears his name. And uh, that verse specifically sounds a lot like something Jesus uh, said in his life. I'm thinking John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know life, or if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. And then he says, from now on, you do, not, you do know him and have seen him. So again, we see Jesus and he's living in us. That's our connection to the Father right there. The same idea is given to us in John's first letter. Just focus on coming alongside those in need. So I will be wrapping it up, closing it uh, soon here, but just wanting to encourage you to be the person that somebody who is in need, in trouble maybe, needs. Uh, the Bible talks about gifts of the Spirit. And once you come to faith in Jesus, you can be guaranteed God's given you at least one of those gifts. And you can look, you know, in the Bible. I know Romans 12 is a chapter. I think uh, 1 Corinthians 12 also has some of the others. One of those special gifts is the gift of encouragement. And that means people who just have this ability to go over and above the call of duty. Not everyone has that special gifting uh, for encouragement, but everyone can encourage to some level anyway. Uh, maybe someone here has that gift of encouragement. I know, uh, and I won't name names, you know who you are, people who are able just to have this ability, they're sending cards all the time and they're calling people and just checking up. That kind of a thing is just, you might not know what that means to somebody else, but believe me, it means an awful lot. And not to say that that's, that may not even be the special gifting that they're talking about in the Bible, but those kind of things any of us can do. But like I said, even if it's not a special gift, you can still be encouraging to someone. And depending on who you encounter, the person without the special gifting may possibly influence somebody 
more than the person with the gift. It's just who you come in contact with and your willingness to meet them where they're at and to walk with them through a difficult time in life. Going back to the title of the message, it's about wisdom, knowing when to act and when to speak in some circumstances, and leadership. It's about being a Christian leader in that sense. You don't wait for somebody to tell you, call this person up. I don't need to be told to do that. Some people just have the ability to do that. And maybe a person you come in contact this week will need encouragement and will need it uh, more than the person with the special gift. Maybe God doesn't work it out that he's bringing his person with the special gift in contact with that person. Maybe he chose you this week instead. Sometimes in our lives it takes difficulties to make us stronger and to appreciate encouragement. Maybe I didn't realize how, how important encouragement was until I was in a bad situation. Somebody came alongside me and encouraged me. So I just encourage you to look for ways to encourage people and to love people because John writes an awful lot about love. And uh, Christians should be the leaders in love in the world. And uh, like I said, maybe, maybe you didn't have that uh, help whenever you were going through a difficult time, but that should be even more reason for you to come alongside someone that you know is struggling because you don't want them to uh, go through the same situation that you were in without help. Um, otherwise, people just go through these tough times in vain. So whether it's encouragement or leading or love or anything else in the Christian life, just remember, we're all united in the faith, all under the same Jesus and the same God. And I'll just close out with the words as John puts it here. Uh, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's close with a word of prayer.